India, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I'm so excited to have you on. Yeah, thank you. It's been a long time coming. I'm happy we're finally making it happen. Uh, I know. And this is going to be a really fun topic because you're so good at this. You're so good at a lot of things, but this is something that you're really passionate about that you've been educating and teaching people about too. It's just all about pricing and stuff. And you probably see a lot of photographers making specific mistakes and it's really fun to just hear your insight about maybe what you think that is and how people can maybe just make small tweaks and change things here with their pricing and packages and presenting them and all those things. So just first things first, we're just going to dive right into it. Like what are some, (laughs) like, let's go like just three common mistakes that you see and you feel like photographers make all the time that you just want to like shake them and be like, just switch this (laughs) and help you a little bit. If you want to maybe just give me three and then we can go back and kind of like digest each. Yeah, totally. I think the three most common ones that I see across all the different niches within the industry is only raising your prices once or twice a year that like just slows your growth so much so I always suggest like basically raising your prices based off of how your demand fluctuates Mm -hmm. and so there's sometimes where like you might be raising your pricing once or twice a month or maybe just once every few months or maybe every x amount of inquiries I have like a whole system that I teach people on how to do that but like only raising your prices once or twice a year just slows your growth so, so much as well as people only like basing their prices off of other people in their area. That is like another big way that you're leaving a lot of money on the table. (laughs) I think that a lot of people think that's the way that you're supposed to compete, but I think that you should compete with everything but your pricing because When I go through and coach people and basically show them like, all right, let's do the whole breakdown of like your expenses, your taxes, what your actual income is. They're making like literally the like, like maybe 15 to $20 an hour, which like when you're a service provider, like we are, you can't be doing that. Like it's so much time that you have to put in. So I like to teach people how to compete with everything but their pricing. So that way the pricing is the least interesting or pivotal part of the process for your clients. So basically teaching people how to add value without having to decrease their cost. So I'm all about like financially empowering people. And then lastly is like not doing add-ons and like just doing the really bland add-ons that I see. I feel like this is mostly happening with wedding photographers, but like every type of photographer should be having niche add-on options for each of their clients. It gives a more luxury feel to the brand. It makes it feel more customizable, unique. And that's how I make about 50% more per inquiry based off of like what people come in to get with me is just like base coverage. And then they end up expanding their package so many times that like I'm making way more money with just one client than trying to spread myself thin across like three or something like that. So that's how you can kind of make more money per client and make more by working less. Yes. Oh, you're speaking my love language. (laughs) I love it. Okay. I love all those too. So I'm excited to talk about those. So circling back to kind of number one is not raise, not having where you just have where you're raising your prices once every year. So kind of you right. like you like dynamic pricing in the sense of that it can fluctuate and it can change based on like maybe demand. So maybe yeah. fall time is crazy time and everybody wants if you're a family photographer, everyone wants fall family photos. And so that way maybe your demand is higher, you can increase your prices. During that exactly. Time. Like you can lower your prices during slow season. You can raise them when booking season comes around. Like all of it comes down to like you tracking your own personal demand rather than trying to only match what everyone else is doing. The most common thing mistake that I see as far as raising prices goes is people raising their prices just once a year in the slow season. Typically like right around New Year's is when people do it and they'll market during the holidays being like, I'm going to raise my prices for 2024. Like make sure to get in the bookings now, which that's totally fine. And that works, but you should have way more of a strategy backing those decisions up rather than just kind of doing it because you see other photographers do it. I think there's like a huge disconnect between us and our pricing. And I think I like get so hyper-focused on it because pricing ends up reflecting a lot of how you show up for your clients and how you show up for your business and your fulfillment. Like even for me now, like if I get a client that maybe, 
you know, wasn't like my favorite experience ever, like, or, you know, maybe it wasn't as aligned. I feel like I don't hold any sort of resistance or animosity towards any situations that might come up because Mm -hmm. I'm being compensated for my worth. And I've also taught them how to value me even outside of the pricing. So there's that mutual respect. And even if it's not like the best fit, I don't have like that negativity going into my business. I don't feel like annoyed if they ask for another rent, you know, version of an edit or Mm -hmm. can you do this or can you do that? Or can you customize this? I'm like, yeah, happy to. Absolutely. Because to me, like everything is all about preserving passion for your business and passion for showing up the best that you can for your clients, for yourself, for your work, for your art. And that is going to have to include you making money. (laughs) I think a lot of artists naturally sell themselves short. And so my whole thing is like, you need to like have your prices reflect where you're at in your business. A lot of people feel like they can only raise their prices once they're quote unquote better, but like you're always going to be hard on yourself, (laughs) probably. (laughs) I don't know very many photographers or artists that get to a certain point in their career where they're like, yeah. I'm the best. I'm not like trying to grow anymore. Like I'm good. I love my work. Like that's just not how it goes. We're always hard on ourselves. Like I'm on my 14th year of photography right now. And I'm still like, I have the same mindset towards my work as I did in a lot of ways when I was like a teenager starting out being like super, yeah, just hard on myself or being like, Oh, I wish this was better. This was better. And if I was like using that as my compass to raising my prices and what my like worth is as far as monetary gain goes, then I would be making way less money and probably overworking myself because obviously to like hit a certain number every year, say you want to make a hundred thousand dollars, seventy thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars with photography, like it is limited because you have to put in time to be able to get that output. So for me, my whole goal is to make more money per client. So I don't have to work for as many clients, which is kind of how we'll segue into the add-ons. But yeah, for me, like, (laughs) I just think it's really important to like have a really good grasp on what your demand is and how to fluctuate that and control that yourself. But everyone always thinks they're like kind of in the victim mentality of their market, their area, their clientele won't pay that yada yada, but you can teach people to pay you anything. Exactly. I th- and isn't that wild too, that just the mindset <laughs> behind all of that and everything that you just said too. And yeah, like I even say, I live in a town of 600 people and mm-hmm. like, I am also helping teach other people how to book like, higher end premium clients and stuff yes. like that. Like there is a way to do it. And something that you said too, that I want to touch base on of like just having strategy in your just this overall number one mistake that you see with just increasing your prices. It's so funny that everyone says, oh, that's the new year. I'm going to raise my prices. And they don't realize because they didn't have a strategy behind it. They're going into slow season, raising their prices. When in reality, that should probably be opposite. And that should probably be the time that they are either keeping their prices the same or, you know, that dynamic pricing strategy. So then they go into raising their prices and they don't book anything. And then they're like, nobody's booking it. And it's like, well, Mm -hmm. that might not have been the best time to do it. And so that's such a good point too, to just have strategy and know behind it when you're doing that and have intention about when it's going to happen too. Yeah. And that's why you have to like, just focus on like, what is happening within your own business rather than looking at other people yes. as models or examples, because maybe their booking season is in December and they right. have a ton of bookings coming in. And yeah. so that strategy works great. And then, yeah, maybe for you, you actually don't get any bookings until February. Like most of my bookings come in during February, March. Yeah. And so like my strategy is going to need to differ from someone's strategy there where they're even like one or two months off of that booking season and slow season. And like, even during that time, it's like, okay, maybe I don't have to actually like drop my prices during this time. Instead, I'm going to restructure my offerings to cater towards slow season specifically and doing Mm -hmm. specials or niche offerings only during that time of year that are limited. There's so many other ways that you can increase your income during times like that. And it all is just so individual. Like that's, I think the main thing that I like to teach people is being like, it's your individual Yes. Situation. It's not the industry controlling your pricing. You control your pricing because you control how people perceive you. 
Yes. Oh, I love that so much. You just, you're taking control basically yeah. <laughs> when you're doing that. I love that. Oh, that is so, that's so awesome. And yeah, like even leading into the next one with like competitive pricing, like you were saying, not basing your pricing off of just what people in the area are or not just attaching yeah. everything you're worth to that competitive pricing. Talk a little bit into that one, number two. Yeah, I'm always about like increasing value than decreasing mm -hmm. prices. But like you don't know, like if you're basing your pricing off of someone else, like you don't know what their life situation is. Mm -hmm. Maybe they are a single mom providing for their entire family on their own. Maybe they have another job. Maybe they have supplementary income. Maybe they have a partner that also helps. Like I remember I had an experience for a while where me and one of my really good friends, Ben, we were like getting into like, photography kind of at the same time. I think I was probably 19 or 20 when this was happening. So quite a while ago, but we had like the exact same clientele, like very, very niche style clientele in Utah, which is already like an insanely competitive market. Right. Like everyone here and their dog yes. is a photographer. Like you <laughs> yes. go up into the mountains here and you, it's so wild, but you'll literally see like 10 plus family sessions going on off the side of the road. And then you'll see like another 10 family sessions a little further up the road. Like everyone here yes. is a photographer. So I felt like I had to keep an edge by competing with my pricing, being really close to his because we were direct competitors, even though we we're like really good friends and we did right. shoots and stuff together all the time. Yeah. And I remember I had this experience where I was like, I don't know what to charge for my pricing. And so I had made a fake email like who knows what it even was probably like horse girl, whatever, whatever, <laughs> hotmail or something. But I went through and I pretended to be a Jane Doe basically. Like I was catfishing all these photographers. Yeah. I was like also like 18 or 17 when this happened. So right. give me a break. I'm sure other people have done it. I mean, but you're not the only one that's done that. Let's that was like <laughs> my only way to do market research as yeah. to figure out like, okay, how much should I charge? Cause I have no idea. So of course the easy option is to be like, okay, I'm going to look at what other people are charging first. So I did that. I got all these photographers pricing. I got Ben's pricing. It was before me and him were friends. Like I had done this when I was so much younger and I had seen that he was charging, I think like $300 for a session or something like that, which like, that's obviously insanely, insanely low, but I matched that. Cause I was like, well, I have to, to be able to like get bookings. And then, you know, fast forward six or seven months, me and Ben become friends. And I talked to him about it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I actually like have to come clean. I catfished you about your pricing, blah, blah, blah. We were like laughing about it. And he was like, oh my God, like don't base your pricing off of me. Like I am just doing this for fun. And he's like, I don't need the money. I have a college scholarship with like my athletic stuff. Like I don't, I have my parents supplementing my income. Like this is literally just for fun for me. And I'm not going to make a business out of it. I'm not making a career out of it. This is just like a little hobby. And that was really good for me to realize like, okay, you actually don't know what their financial needs are. You also might be blindly basing your pricing off of someone else that doesn't know what they're fucking doing with mm -hmm. their pricing. And they might be basing it off of another person's pricing that doesn't know what they're doing. And so that's why it ends up just creating like, I don't know, these big gaps in like what people and photography should be valued at versus what the industry thinks it is because we're all just looking at each other, but we're all still kind of guessing. And so that's why you have to like really double down and make your own system that you can rely on and track and feel really confident that you're never over or under charging. Totally. And yeah, that's such, so relatable too. And so like, even for someone listening to this, they're like, okay, yes, great. How now can I figure out what I should be charging? So there's a lot of ways to do this. Obviously, like the first steps are calculate your expenses, go through and figure out everything that it costs to run your business on a yearly basis, monthly basis. Make sure that you take into account taxes if you are a registered business. And obviously it's different for every single state. So you kind of have to look up what this is. Like in Utah, I increase all of my prices by about 35% in order to make up for the taxes. And so adding that on top, I remember the first year I registered my business, I like didn't even, I mean, I was like still a teenager yes. and I just didn't really think about that. And then uh -huh. at the end of the year, because I didn't raise my prices to reflect like, 
my taxes, I ended up losing a lot of money paying yeah. taxes. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, okay, not doing that again. And then you have to go through and figure out what you need for your own life, like how you need to be paying yourself out from a business perspective to you being the employee. And there's a few different ways that you can do that, but just getting really clear on how much money that you need to be bringing in versus how much profit you want to be trying to pull in per job and per offering. So once you figure all of that out, then I suggest people to figure out what their baseline hourly rate is. And there's like so many different ways that you can do that. It's pretty easy to calculate, but figure out what you need to be making per hour. And that hourly rate is how I build out all of my offerings. So that is like all the minimum amounts that I need to be charging per offering. And then from there, I raise them based off of my demand. So tracking your demand is really important. I know I keep like bringing that up. No, yeah. I have like a whole system that I teach people yeah. how to do it with, but basically you want to be looking at how many inquiries are coming in. What's your booking rate? How many people are following through? And then going through the process of backtracking and being like, okay, at the beginning of the client journey, they find my work here. And then they get all the way to this point where they're sending an email. And then where do they drop off? Is it with my pricing or is it with the way that I'm communicating my pricing? Mm -hmm. Like people typically feel like if they get ghosted, they immediately blame it on their pricing or they'll get those messages, which I think that systems should be set up to prevent these messages because it gets in your head. But getting responses from people being like, oh, you're too out of our budget or another photographer said they do it for this much, but we really want to work with you. Like those things are going to constantly be impeding on your self-confidence with your pricing. And you need to just like, for me, I make it so no one reaches out to me unless they know they can already afford me. That's why I put my starting prices on my website. Cause I don't need to waste time going back and forth, emailing with people that have half the budget of what I, my starting prices are at. So I suggest people to put their starting prices on their website. So that way you do get people in the door that know they can afford at least your very cheapest package. And so for me, when people email me, I'm already like, Oh, I got this in the bag. Like mm -hmm. they're going to hire me because they can afford me. It's just going to come down to whether or not we're a good fit or I'm available. So that's kind of like how I do that. So that way I'm not getting those messages of like, can you do discounts? Can you do that? Can you do this? Yeah. But it's good to like go through that process over and over and over and track like, where do I think people are falling off? Because might not actually be your pricing. 90% of the time it's not unless your pricing is really jacked up or yeah, it's usually not that because typically people are undercharging. So it's something that's happening along the client journey of how you're presenting value and worth and communicating that effectively for your specific clientele. And that's like another thing that I love to teach people because it is so much about communicating value. You can get people to value anything. Like I look at like designer handbags. I like, I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> Why someone would pay $7,000 for a purse, but like they do it. There's people that do. They don't even need that. How yeah. crazy is that? They could buy a freaking car with that. So it really all just comes down to making people think that they need you or want you over anyone else so much so that like they they want you regardless of their prices. They'll move their budget around in other areas in order to work with you. And that's how you get that competitive edge without having to fluctuate your pricing around it. I'm interrupting my own episode to give you a quick glimpse into my signature coaching program created for established photographers wanting to double to quadruple their prices, book their highest package, and bring in inquiries consistently. This is my high-level container of go-to photographers who are making huge waves in the industry. And the biggest difference in this program is that we get a full 12 months together for deep dive transformation, weekly coaching call support, four coaches in the program to deep dive into specific topics and a content retreat all included in one program. And I always say, if you can book one extra wedding from your year in the program together, you're going to see your ROI and it's just the weekly norm wins for my students. So I'm fully confident that you're going to be able to do that and way, way more. And this is an application, phone call and acceptance process only type of program. So if you are curious if this is the right next steps for you to just blow up your business this year, you can fill out the application at rachelchrexler.com slash apply or get the link in the show notes. 
I'll be in touch shortly after you fill it out so that we can talk through together if this is the right fit for you. I'm very honest with people and I want this to be a great fit for everyone involved. That's just my heart behind the way I do this process. And I also think that's why my students just see so much success in this program. So don't just be an information consumption overload this year. I want you to be an action taker and start implementing change into your business. So again, if this feels aligned to you, fill out the application at racheltraxler.com slash apply to apply for my passion to profit coaching program. Oh, okay. I feel like my brain thinks the same exact way you do. And I love this because I feel like we're on the <laughs> same wavelength and I love this so much because I even had like a student recently, like she, you know, was sending pricing or like that whole mm-hmm. communication, the onboarding booking process with a client. And she sent over information. She goes, and before she even heard back from the, like the potential client, she's like, it's my pricing, my pricing, it's too much. It's all this mm-hmm. stuff. And she didn't even send pricing yet at this oh. point. Like, and like, so it's like, it's not <laughs> your pricing. It's just like, isn't it funny how we just get in our heads though? And we mm-hmm. immediately think that that's, that it's either our prices or our work isn't good enough or mm-hmm. something that we just get in our heads right away. It's, it's yep. wild. Before we add, like we'll segment into like add-ons and stuff, but I want to ask you too, because there's so many different ways you can do this, that you like to have your starting price on your website. And you know, there's different reasons of like, I feel like I could give you 20 reasons why you should, shouldn't, can, can't, what it does. And like, there's no right or wrong, which is why I look, I love it. But do you feel like you enjoy having that because then, like you said, when people reach out, they know, you know, that they can at least do that, but then it gives you a potential the opportunity to do add-ons because that's number three for you is that people aren't doing add-ons. So is that why you kind of like to do that or speak a little bit more of it into that? So I have, I suggest everyone put starting prices on their website. You can do what you want. I just know like for me, when I go into like some store where they don't have prices on stuff, I immediately am turned off because then I'm like, it's this psychological thing where you feel like you are not in control. And anytime you confuse the client, that's like distancing their relationship with you and their trust with you. And that is such a huge part, especially when we're charging, you know, thousands of dollars for like wedding day coverage. Like I can't be asking people to pay me 10 grand plus if I, if they're kind of coming in already confused, they're already going to have their guard up a little bit. So it's a nice way to help people bring their guard down, make them feel in control, make them feel like it's their choice every step of the way. And they're not getting blindsided at any point. So before they get emotionally invested, they already know like, okay, yes, like I do, I can't afford this. Let me dig in a little bit more. Let me send an inquiry. So it's almost a way to like establish a sense of safety and control for the client. So I put my prices, just the starting prices up. So I say elopement start at 5,000 sessions, start at 2,000, 3,000, whatever it is. So that way, yes, like when people come in, they can at least afford my base base Mm -hmm. coverage. And then from there, that's where I start upselling them with add-ons and other things to basically make it an a la carte experience that feels very, very personalized to them because that's in line with my brand and my messaging and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I suggest putting the starting prices on. I would not say put all of your pricing on your website. Just do the starting prices because you do want to hook them in enough where they know they can afford you. But once they reach out, that's where you can start working your magic and using like a pricing guide that is laid out in a really functional and beautiful way to help them kind of walk through the experience of figuring out and how to envision what it would be like to work with you. And you need to go through and establish, obviously, like, here's all the logical stuff. Here's the pricing. This is what's included. This is that. This is the frequently asked questions, blah, blah, blah. And then you also need to layer in how to make it a very emotional experience where they, as they're going through your pricing guide, are starting to picture themselves having that experience with you. For me, this works really well because so much of my taglines and stuff are like, quote unquote, experience over everything, because that is I think the thing that gives me a competitive edge against other photographers where I can have the same photographer or another photographer come to the shoot with me, shoot the same photos on the same gear, yada, yada. But like, I know I have something to offer that that photographer can't. Mm -hmm. And like, it does come down to this thing that can't be duped, ripped off, duplicated, anything like that. And that's like, your personality. Right. And so figuring out how to weave in those little magic bits of yourself, the things that other people can't steal or like, 
duplicate or replicate in their own business, that's going to be what helps sell people for the right reasons. So that way they're booking you for reasons that feel really good as an artist, rather than just being booked because you were the budget photographer, you okay. fit in, like it was, you were cheap enough, yada, yada. Like, I don't want to be hired because I was affordable. I want to be hired because there was an actual connection that they made with my work and how they envision themselves in that experience. So I make sure to use copy and messaging throughout the pricing guide that I give people to help them slowly kind of ease into this idea of imagining themselves doing that. So that way you're kind of hooking them logically and emotionally. This is just like basic marketing yes. pretty much. Yes. <laughs> it sounds like manipulative, but it's really not. That's just no, like yeah. very basic marketing. Yeah. And it's just like connect. It all comes down to just like connecting with people. And so like, mm -hmm. it, it's just, yeah, like marketing is connecting with people. And so when you can do that, that's aligned with you because everyone's just going to be different. That's when people are going to be market, like attracted to you that way, totally. which is awesome. And I know add-ons can get really tricky really fast. So is there a way that you like to just seamlessly and like effectively offer add-ons so it doesn't get too like too many options and too confusing for people. Like, how yeah, do you, like definitely. One of my biggest tips is always to like keep things simpler than you mm -hmm. think, especially when it comes to pricing. I've seen yeah. some wacky stuff that people have yeah. done with their pricing and their packaging and offers to try and like make it seem like there's a lot of value for this price, go for the higher package. But like, even me, like I'll go through people's pricing guides and be like, I don't know what's going on. Like right. I'm confused and yeah. I'm a photographer. Like imagine yeah. a client where this is their first time or maybe one of the first few times they've ever hired a photographer. Like you have to make things make perfect sense. So again, it establishes that sense of control for the client. If you confuse them, you're scaring them off. Like that is just creating <laughs> so much distance between you and them. And as far as the connection goes. And so yeah, I would just say to make sure that like your add-ons are simple, really easy to understand. I go for personally an a la carte experience because that's what works well for me and my clients. There's so many different ways that you can do it. And it's always going to come back to like what works best for you and your clientele. You're going to know that better than any mentor or whoever can tell you what to do. But I like doing the a la carte where people get a base amount of coverage. And then from there, they can customize their package by doing these different add-ons, whether it's extending their wedding day coverage into full wedding weekend coverage, and then adding mm -hmm. on this session where I do a mini session with their grandparents the night before. And then we go and do like a session with just the, po like the portraits for the bride and groom the day after. So that way we don't have to do it on the actual wedding day. And then maybe a rush turnaround fee for people that are eloping that really want those photos back quickly. Like I'm thinking about my clientele and how to solve problems for them or how to amplify their experience that they already have. It could be film. It could be another shooter. It could be so many different things. But I think the thing that I see people fall short on is having really basic, boring add-ons where you're just kind of putting it on there because you're like, I need to put this on there, like additional mm -hmm. coverage, an additional right. hour or a second shooter. Those are two really popular ones you see on almost every photographer's pricing guide, but then it'll literally say second shooter X amount. And it's like, okay, but like, why do we need a second shooter? Right. Why would you suggest a second shooter? In what situations? How can you help them picture that experience? What's the value of having a second shooter? Because otherwise, they're not going to add it on. If you add one little blurb under second shooter and, oh, this is great because then, you know, I can't be in two places at once. This helps us get even more coverage to maximize the amount of coverage that you've already paid for. It also acts as a backup. God forbid, like you lose any of the photos, but then you do have another set of a backup for photos that immediately gets people to be like, yep, let's do it. Why not? It's only this much more mm -hmm. rather than like extending coverage and having me show up and be there for like two more hours to get getting ready photos or whatever it is. Like monetarily, you can show that it makes more sense just to have a second shooter. So that's like an example of how I think you can really maximize people adding things on as well as taking the extra step to kind of customize the experience to your clientele or to things that you get excited about offering. Like one of the things that I did last year that was so much fun was I did boudoir sessions for, I only did it with one or two brides, but we did a boudoir session the day before their wedding. So it was like kind of a self-love session. And it was just yeah. so beautiful to do that. And I was like, I think all my brides should have this option because this is absolutely beautiful experience. It amplifies everything. We can take all these 
cute little saucy Polaroids. And then she can use that as like the wedding day gift just to slip him, you know, in the morning or something with his coffee, like just something cute. And it's like, I can literally just take what I just said to you and then put it into a little paragraph. And then all my brides are like, absolute yes. I, I definitely it. want that. Like yeah. when else am I going to have like an excuse? I'm already looking hot for my wedding. Yes. <laughs> Why not add it on type of thing? So like that's so- something fun for me. It adds value to their experience with me and adds value to their entire wedding experience. So that's like an example of a creative niche add-on that I offer people that makes it so people want me even more because okay, yeah, like maybe the pricing is similar to another photographer that has same caliber of work, but they're like, I want that experience with India. Mm. I don't see that add on with another photographer. I want something more niche and special. And especially with weddings, people want to feel special. So any way that you can make them feel that over and over is another great way to get them to trust you and choose you over someone else, regardless of pricing. A hundred percent. And that's just what helps you stand out too. Like totally exactly what you said. And it's going to differentiate all of those things. And Mm -hmm. exactly. It's like people, we don't realize we're so close to our zone of like, yeah, second shooter. And we just call it a second shooter, but it's like, or yeah. like an extra hour. It's like, how can, but our, our clients don't know that. Like we're so that. close to that. Like, can we name it something else besides a second shooter? Like, can we elevate the name to it? I yes, mean, exactly. Something because it's such just verbiage for, for us. It's photographer mm-hmm. verbiage that we just use in the industry. It's like, how can we elevate that wording even for our clients? And Absolutely. Talking about it, like you said, one little blurb of two, three sentences of what it is. Boom. Yes. That makes, makes a so huge much more difference. Sense. <laughs> huge. Yeah. Oh, that is, yeah. So, so powerful. But then also with your add-ons, because you have just a base package and all that stuff, you have a few different really awesome add-on a la carte style. Do you just have your clients look through their your pricing information and they just email you back? Or do you have something set up in like HoneyBook where you do a brochure where they can just go in and customize and add that to themselves? I'm just trying to think of some questions that people might be thinking of. How do I make this easy? Because I know you say you like to make the process easy. So totally. is it where they're actually customizing it or they're emailing you back? What does like that process look like? So I, I've i tried a few different ways through mm-hmm. the years, yes. but I found what works best for me and adds it works best for my clients too. adds value, makes everything again, easier, which is great. That's always yep. going to help. Yep. When people reach out, with their first inquiry, I respond with whatever details I give them my pricing. And then I also give them a Calendly link for them to schedule a call with me. Mm -hmm. And I say, let's hop on the phone within the next few days for just like a quick 10 to 15 minute connection call. We can go over any of your questions. We can talk about vision. We can make plans. We can talk about availability and just see kind of like what you're wanting to get out of this. And so for me, I hate emailing back and forth. That's wonderful. (laughs) I also think it helps establish a more personal connection. Like what photographers are going out of their way to hurry and make like a 10 or 15 minute call happen within a couple days of them emailing while they're still excited versus all these other people that are just like, all right, yeah, just like click whatever ones you want in HoneyBook and then like add to cart and then I'll send you the contract. Like what a completely different experience as far as luxury goes and making, again, making people feel really special. And so like, that's where the emailing stops. Once they get my pricing guide and that Calendly link within my first response back, we immediately book a call. We hop on the call. We go through everything on that call. Literally usually takes less than 15 minutes for me to do that and talk about vision and get them excited, create that emotional connection. And then at the end of the call, I ask them what pro- like what they want, what coverage they want. And then I send the contract right away. So that's like a way to kind of help that process move along and making it easier for them. So that way there's just less steps, less back and forth, less yeah. questioning. Because again, if they start to question things or whatever, it, it makes them feel like they can't trust. And then that usually ends up pushing a lot of people to either feel like they have to micromanage or they're going to go with someone else that it is easier or cheaper or whatever. So that's kind of that process. So I just, I do it for them so that it way it feels more luxury for them, but it's yeah. so much easier for me too. <laughs> that, yeah. That's such a good point too of, yeah. Cause otherwise it kind of seems transactional sometimes where totally. it's like, just you're like, check out, like you're just checking, buying something out online. So I yeah. think that is like that connection point, which is so awesome. And I know you do a lot of travel and stuff like that too. So do you ever get where say you get um, an inquiry for like an Italy wedding and like you, do you ever do custom proposals with that? 
You know what I mean? Instead of sending mm-hmm. your standard pricing being like, oh, well, here's my Europe pricing maybe. Totally. My- yeah. There's so many different ways that you can price traveling and I've done it in all the ways actually. <laughs> and what I found that works best for me, my work style, the predictability that I have within my travel schedule and the areas that I accept to go to, like I don't go to East Coast for shoots. I only go to West yeah. Coast and that makes it really predictable for me to know basically how much it's going to be every yeah. single time I go out to the West Coast, whether it's California. California or Montana or Washington, whatever, like it's usually going to be around the same cost. And so I actually just do everything is included. Mm -hmm. I have a local session, like figure it out. So basically people can hire me for within Utah and they get one pricing guide. If they hire me with like beyond Utah, I know because I'm not going to New York city, like it's going to be a pretty like predictable amount that I'm going to have to set aside. So I just budget it into my pricing. So again, that's making it easier, making it feel more luxury for people to see all pricing, all travel is included within this package price. They're like, great. Don't have to worry about it. Again, makes it easy. Takes one more step out of the process of them being like, oh, okay, well, I actually found like a cheaper flight. Like if you were just billing people directly for like, Hey, here was like my flights and rental car and hotel. Here's the bill. They might be like, oh, well, like I saw that there was like, maybe you can stay with like my mom so we can yeah. save a few hundred dollars. It's like, no. Let's take all that out. <laughs> I've done, I did that for years. Yes. I'm uh-huh. good now. But yeah, so, and that's nice because then it gives me the flexibility of being able to like travel cheap if I want and pocket a little bit of that extra money. Or I can like ball out and like yeah. do a bougie <laughs> trip out of it and like gift that to myself because it doesn't matter and it doesn't make me feel mm-hmm. weird how that makes the couple feel. Like, because it is just all included. And so sometimes you might make money, sometimes you might lose some, but ultimately if you know your travel schedule really well, you'll be able to hone in on a very specific price and know that you're always coming out even with it or profiting. If you have a really unpredictable schedule where, yeah, it's like you might be going to Europe and then Asia and then Australia, like that might be more of like a custom proposal approach, or you can just have like, you know, Western hemisphere, it's this set price. Like add that onto any of my coverage. If it's in this hemisphere or if it's in Northern America, Southern America, Europe, like there's so many different ways that you can do that. So yeah, it's just kind of figuring out what works for you. But I know for me, it's made it so much easier to get high end luxury clients by just including it and doing the research to be able to do that. For sure. And just kind of knowing it ahead of time. And like you Mm -hmm. said, just having certain regions and and all that stuff. And that's actually really, really helpful and really good to know. Such good points too. And then that way you don't feel that you still can be transparent about the the pricing and the packages and it still looks the same. It just might be different depending on location. So the process sounds essentially the same for you. The Mm -hmm. package just might be different depending on the inquiry. That is awesome. That's less work on you, but still being able to create that connection, which is really awesome. I love that India. Is there like, just to like tie this up, wrap it all up. Is there just like one last piece of advice you want to give to people about just pricing or any mistakes that you see? Any last advice? I feel like you're so good at this topic too. So I would say you are probably undercharging and it is so crappy to have to sit down and go through and figure all of that out. Cause I know pricing does feel like a beast, especially if you're already kind of feeling a little insecure with it, not knowing if you're overcharging, undercharging, if you're correctly priced, if there's like ways that you can raise your pricing without giving more, like there's so many options, but like it really is worth taking the time to sit down and gift yourself that process of going through all of that. Because again, like I'm all about preserving passion because one of the top reasons why I think a lot of photographers get burnt out is because they are not making the amount of money to reflect the amount of energy that they are putting in. And so for me, I look at the way that I charge and the money that I'm making as this energetic exchange that happens between me and my clients. They're not just buying my work. They're also buying the entire experience. Like I've had photos taken before where the photos turn out freaking gorgeous, amazing, best photos I've ever seen, but the experience just sucked being the client. And like, I look at that, those photos and I'm like, "Uh, okay, yeah. Like there's just so many, you know, miscommunications or difficulties or I felt weird, blah, blah, blah. So I don't really love those versus like other experiences where maybe the photos don't turn out as like as technically incredible, but I felt so connected to the photographer. I felt really comfortable. I felt like I could be myself. I felt like the process was really easy. And that 
reflects the way that the client feels about their own images. So it's so much more than just the photos. And so for you to preserve your passions, that way you can continue bringing that good energy into your business and be giving and generous and all of that in these ways, like you can still be so generous and charge your worth, but it does require you to have to sit down and figure out how to create a strategy for yourself that is bulletproof, that doesn't impede on your financial safety for the next six to 12 months. And so I teach how to do that in my pricing workshops. That's like a way that you could kind of just fast track that process. You can get it done within like a week, but there's also, you don't need a workshop in order to teach that to you. I would say just like start with the baby steps, figure out all of your expenses, all of like what you need as far as how to pay yourself out, take into account taxes. And then from there, figure out your hourly rate and rebuild your pricing using that hourly rate. But yeah, if you need help, I have a pricing workshop on it, but either way, like you're going to probably be shocked at how little you're actually making per hour when you sit down and actually calculate all of it out. But it's so worth it because then you can empower yourself financially, which I think then empowers you in your work, in your art, and with your clients. Oh, mic drop, India. (laughs) Way (laughs) way to just bring it on home. (laughs) I love that. Honestly, like everything you're saying, yes, it is, is awesome. And honestly, I feel like everyone listening is going to take a lot from this too. So why don't you tell us where we can find you and get connected to all the things? Yes. My Instagram is just my name. So at India Earl, I have my education on IndiaEarlEducation.com. So those are the main places to find me now. <laughs> Amazing. I'm sure everyone's already following you already, but <laughs> so good to just have that connection piece anyway. But thank you so much, India. This was so awesome. I'm excited thank for this one. Thank you. <laughs> yes.